people often get up to weird stuff, and the world can be a weird place at times. Take for instance that time when America contemplated nuking the moon. Or the seemingly weird reason why the pilgrims ended up in Massachusetts. Following our 20 things about those and other weird moments from history. Weird displays in weird times. Mankind has seldom come as close to extinction as it did during the Cold War. It was a dangerous time, with both superpowers and their allies often on the brink. When not fighting each other through proxies, the US and USSR often engaged in macho threat displays, kind of like two dogs growling at each other, or two tomcats engaged in a hissing competition. Some of the superpowers' threat displays were subtle, while others were as subtle as a sledgehammer to the head, unsurprisingly, the machismo got weird at times. As in way, way, weird. As in nuking the moon weird something that the America contemplated doing in the 1950s. Sputnik scare leads to weird ideas. In the early Cold War years, notwithstanding the Red Scare and anti-communist hysteria, most Americans felt relatively secure at home from foreign attack, even after the Soviets detonated their first atom bomb in 1949, few doubted America's nuclear superiority. Nor did we doubt the superiority of the U.S. Air Force, and its bombers' ability to nuke Russia, while keeping Russian bombers from nuking us back. Then in 1957, the Soviets launched Sputnik 1, the first artificial Earth satellite, that terrified America. Sputnik itself was harmless, but Soviet rockets powerful enough to launch it into space, were powerful enough to launch atomic weapons at the U.S. America's sense of invulnerability evaporated. To restore American confidence, many ideas were bounced back and forth, quite a few of them weird. However few of them were as weird as the idea of nuking the moon. Carl Sagan once researched nuking the moon. In the late 1950s, America's space program was on the ropes, while the Soviets were scooping us by successfully launching satellites and demonstrating the power of their rockets, so the Eisenhower administration came up with a secret project, a study of lunar research flights. The project's innocuous title masked its true, and truly weird, purpose, detonating a nuke on the moon, the former Armour Research Foundation, now part of the Illinois Institute of Technology, was tasked with the research. Among the researchers was a then young graduate student, Carl Sagan, who would go on to become a global celebrity for popularizing science and astronomy on TV. Nuking the Moon Carl Sagan contributed to the moon nuking project with research and calculations, mostly on the expected behavior of the dust and gas caused by a nuclear detonation on the lunar surface, as envisioned, an American missile carrying a nuclear bomb would launch from Earth, travel 238,000 miles to the moon and detonate upon impact. As an official involved in the project recounted decades later, now it seems ridiculous and unthinkable. But things were remarkably tense then. The Eisenhower administration hoped that seeing the nuclear flash on the moon from Earth would restore American confidence after the launch of Sputnik simultaneously it would intimidate the Soviets by demonstrating that the U.S. had an effective nuclear deterrent. The plan could have been carried out by 1959, when the U.S. Air Force began deploying ICBMs. However, the weird project was abandoned, because of the risk to people on Earth in case of failure, and because scientists raised concerns about contaminating the moon with radiation. Why the Pilgrims Landed on Plymouth Rock Few things can kill a party or put a damper on festivities as quickly as running out of beer, however the lack of beer seldom produces results as far-reaching as what occurred in the summer of 1620. Weird as it might sound, the pilgrims ended up settling in Massachusetts because they were running low on beer. Today, that could seem like a trifling reason for making such an important decision. Back then however beer was a serious matter. It began on August 5, 1620, when the Mayflower departed Plymouth, England, for a journey across the Atlantic to the newly established Virginia colony, in other words when they set out, the Pilgrims' destination had not been Massachusetts, but a point significantly further south. The vagaries of weather, the hardships of crossing an ocean in a 17th century sailing ship, coupled with low levels of beer, led them to change their minds about where to settle. The Pilgrims had actually set out for Virginia. As every American schoolchild is taught, the Pilgrims crossed the Atlantic Ocean in the Mayflower, they landed at Plymouth Rock, and established Plymouth as a settlement, about 40 miles south of modern Boston. 
however Plymouth at roughly 42 degrees latitude and, had not been the pilgrims' intended destination. When they left England, they had aimed for a destination hundreds of miles down the eastern seaboard in the Virginia colony, at roughly 40 degrees latitude n. However, the pilgrims encountered many setbacks. They had planned to sail from England in July 1620, but most of them were then living in Leiden, in the Netherlands. So the plan was for a sister ship, the Speedwell to sail from England to the Netherlands, pick up the passengers return to Southampton, join the Mayflower, and then the two ships would sail together in convoy to Virginia. A weird and frustrating series of setbacks. On August 5, 1620, the Mayflower and the Speedwell sailed from England to the New World. However, the Mayflower sister ship was unfortunately named, and was neither speedy nor well. The Speedwell began leaking, so the pilgrims docked in Dartmouth for repairs. They set out again on August 21, but after a few days at sea, the Speedwell started leaking again. The voyage's leaders concluded that the Speedwell was simply not up to crossing the Atlantic, so they decided to leave her in England and sail to the New World in the Mayflower. After transferring supplies from the Speedwell, the Mayflower finally set out on September 6, over a month behind schedule. It would be a tough voyage. A rough crossing. The Mayflower's voyage proceeded smoothly at first, that changed as the ship encountered bad weather and worse storms during the second half of the trip. On November 9, 1620, 66 days after departing England, a voyage they had hoped would take a month, the pilgrims finally spotted land at today's Cape Cod. They were about 250 farther north than their original aiming point. All else being equal, the pilgrims would have simply sailed down the coast until they reached their intended destination. All else was not equal, however, and the pilgrims faced a serious problem. They were out of beer. Back then drinking water aboard ship was liable to go bad, especially on long voyages. Sea voyagers relied on beer as a drinking source that would not spoil. So running out of the brewed stuff was a big deal. Seen from that perspective the pilgrims making of a momentous decision because of beer does not seem so weird. Weird as it sounds, if not for a beer shortage, we might be talking about the New York pilgrims today. When the pilgrims set sail, their initial destination had been a Virginia colony island teeming with wildlife and natural resources. The site had a huge natural harbor and a navigable river that led deep into the interior. The Virginia colony's borders in 1620 were not the same as those of today's Virginia. Back then, the Virginia colony's northern boundary was about 225 miles farther north than Virginia's current border. The island where the pilgrims had intended to establish their colony is today called Manhattan. Instead the lack of beer led them to explore the coastline of Cape Cod and the nearby mainland region until they finally decided upon a site. On Christmas Day 1620, the pilgrims founded Plymouth Plantation as their new colony, and importantly, the site where they would brew up a fresh batch of beer. Weird as it sounds, if not for the pilgrims running out of beer, we might be referring to them today as the Virginia or Manhattan Pilgrims, instead of the Massachusetts Pilgrims. Albert Einstein's greatest breakthroughs were accomplished by the time he was 26. When most people picture Albert Einstein, they picture an aging man, with disheveled and wild white hair it stands to reason that most people would assume that Einstein's most important work must have occurred at the tail end of a long life, spent doing complex physics and math stuff. It might sound weird especially to those of us who spent our 20s in a haze, but Einstein did most of his heavy intellectual lifting by the time he was in his mid-20s, his greatest contributions to science, such as his theory of relativity, had taken place by the time he was 26. In 1905 after graduating from the University of Zurich, Einstein was working as a patent office examiner and dabbling in physics on his free time. During a span of a few brief months, he came up with four theories that revolutionized science. Super genius does more in a year than most ordinary geniuses do in a lifetime. In January and February of 1905, Albert Einstein came up with the theory of relativity, demonstrating that Isaac Newton was wrong about space and time being absolute. In March he again revolutionized science with his work on quantum theory. Then in April and May he published a pair of papers that proved the assumed, but hitherto unverified existence of the atom. Einstein did all of that by the time he was 26. For the remainder of his life, he lived another half-century before dying in 1955, 
None of Einstein's scientific contributions match those of 1905, which is not to say that he coasted for the rest of his life on the accomplishments of his youth. However, if he had done that, it would have been okay. His accomplishments in that single year exceeded the contributions of the entire lifetimes of multiple geniuses. American president born in the 18th century has grandsons living in 2020. John Tyler was nothing special, far as American presidents go, he was elected as vice president on the 1840 Whig ticket, then became president when the head of the ticket, William Henry Harrison, caught pneumonia while giving his inaugural speech, and died after a mere 31 days in office. Tyler was a mediocrity as a president, he ended up infuriating both his own Whig party and the opposition Democrats. Tyler muddled through to the end of a forgettable single term, and was not renominated by his party. To the extent that he is known to many today, it might be as one of the names in the Simpsons song, Mediocre Presidents. However, there is one extraordinary thing about Tyler, weird as it sounds, although Tyler was born in the 18th century in 1790, his grandsons who are still alive at the time of this writing in the 21st century. How did that come about? The Tyler's Weird Virility Billy goats are known for virility and remaining sexually active well into old age, an ancient billy goat at death's door often still has the libido to totter over to, get it on with and impregnate a nanny goat. The Tyler males might be the billy goats of mankind. Not only do they remain sexually active well into old age, but they also possess potent and seemingly ageless sperm that retains its virility and ability to impregnate, despite the owner's decrepitude. President Tyler's 15th kid, Lion Gardner Tyler, was born in 1853 when his father was 63 in 1925 when Lyon was 71. He fathered Gardner Tyler Jr. about four years later. A 75-year-old Lyon fathered Harrison Ruffin Tyler. And 96 and 92, respectively. Both Gardner and Harrison are still going strong and doing well for their age. So President Tyler's crowning achievement is the weird accomplishment of having grandson, who are still alive in the 21st century, 230 years after he was born in the 18th century. An emperor's weird sense of humor. Heliogobulus was made ruler of the Roman Empire when he was barely 14, as might be expected, handing that kind of power to a teenager did not turn out well. While not as horrible as some of Rome's more monstrous rulers, he was no gratuitously cruel Caligula or Commodus, Heliogobulus did display the occasional mean streak. That streak often showed in his practical jokes, some were funny, some were weird and some were scary and weird. Considering that he was the emperor, with nobody above him, Heliogobulus' pranks always meant punching down. At the milder end of the emperor's pranking was his propensity for seating, some of his more pompous dinner guests on the ancient Roman version of Wu-P cushions, that emitted farting noises when they parked their posterior. At the crueler end of the spectrum, as seen below, was putting people in fear of their lives. Scary Weird Pranking Embarrassing people by seating them on whoopee cushions, whatever the downside, is a relatively harmless practical joke, it is coarse humor, but mostly innocent fun. Not so Heliogobulus' weird and sadistic habit of pranking people, by putting them in mortal fear of life and limb. One of his favorite pranks began, with the teenaged emperor getting his dinner guests so drunk, that they had to crash and sleep it off in the palace. Once Heliogobulus' marks were zonked out, the emperor had his servants sneak tamed lions, leopards, bears, or a mix thereof, into the bedroom. Come the morning, the emperor would bust a gut laughing at his hungover guest's reaction to waking up, in the midst of a menagerie of man-eating predators. Between that and other weird behavior that his subjects viewed as deviant, the Romans heaved a sigh of relief, when Heliogobulus was violently overthrown at age 18. He was beheaded, his corpse was tossed into the Tiber River, and his memory was damned by a senatorial edict. A weird plan makes a tiny community famous. Vulcan, in Mingo County, West Virginia, is a small community on the state's southwest border with Kentucky. In the 1970s, Vulcan had its 15 minutes of fame when it became known nationally and around the globe for a weird and riveting plan to get a bridge. Surrounded by mountains on three sides and the Tug River on the fourth, Vulcan would probably never have been inhabited if coal had not been discovered there in the early 20th century. A coal mining camp sprang up, and eventually gave rise to a small but thriving community. Thriving that is until the coal ran out in the early 1960s. Soon as the coal was gone, 
Bolton's population began shrinking, until it was reduced to a few dozen families, stubborn holdouts unwilling to leave the place they knew as home, to the extent that the outside world had ever taken notice of Vulcan, it forgot about it soon as the coal ran out. That was a problem for the locals, seeing how they were all but cut off from the rest of the world. Isolated Vulcan Vulcan WV was described thus in a 1972 book, their biggest problem was that the state had forgotten to build a road into the community. Although state maps showed a road into Vulcan, it was nowhere to be found. The only way people could get in and out was to drive up the Kentucky side and walk across a swinging bridge, which was too narrow for a vehicle. The bridge had been built by the coal company years before and was on the verge of collapse, although there were boards missing, the children had to walk across it to catch the school bus on the Kentucky side. Lack of a road was a serious hardship, on their way to and from school, Vulcan's children had to crawl under parked railroad coal cars, which often blocked the community's sole bridge. One child lost a leg doing that. There was a side road that ran through Vulcan. However, it belonged to a railroad that placed it off-limits, and vigorously prosecuted those who used it for trespass. A weird scheme to get help. Vulcan's residents pleaded for years with county, state, and federal officials to repair their rickety bridge, however their pleas fell on deaf ears, and they were consistently ignored by the powers that be. In the meantime, their bridge kept on deteriorating, and becoming an ever greater hazard to life and limb. Feeling forsaken by their own government, the Vulcanites opted for a weird and drastic move that soon garnered international headlines. In 1977 Vulcan's mayor wrote the Soviet embassy in Washington, D.C., as well as officials in communist East Germany, describing Vulcan's plight and requesting foreign aid to build a bridge. The Soviets jumped on the opportunity to embarrass the U.S. and dispatch journalists to Vulcan. By interviewing and broadcasting the locals' woes, the Soviets finally brought attention to the ignored community. Vulcan's weird scheme endeared it to some, and infuriated others. It did not take long before newspapers from coast to coast were talking about Vulcan and its weird ploy to get a bridge. The Spokane Daily Chronicle, which wrote, Soviet officials were amused today by reports that the small town of Vulcan has appealed to the Kremlin for foreign aid, the town with a population of 200, asked the Soviet government for financial help to build a bridge, after the town was turned down by the U.S. and West Virginia governments. However, many anti-communist types did not see the humor and were not amused. Radio stations and local newspapers received a flood of bomb threats, threatening to blow up any bridge built with communist foreign aid. Vulcan's scheme might have been weird, but it worked. The USSR's embassy in Washington, D.C. sent a senior journalist on December 17, 1977, to meet Vulcan's mayor and survey the problem. The Soviet authorized their emissary to promise the locals that his government would keep an eye on the situation and pay for building them a bridge if their own government did do so soon. Within an hour of that visit, word filtered down to reporters milling about Vulcan that West Virginia's government had agreed to build a bridge, the state legislature authorized $1.3 million for the task. Today a one-lane graffiti-covered bridge connects the people of Vulcan to the outside world.